So let's look, look at the divisions of the nervous system. So what we have is the peripheral nervous system as well as the central nervous system. And so the peripheral nervous system is going to take in sensory information and it's also going to execute motor function. While the central nervous system, what it's going to do is it's going to integrate the information that it collects from the peripheral nervous system, it's going to process it, and it's going to initiate behavior. So one thing that we have to cover is what's found in the CNS versus the PNS. So in the PNS, we have ganglion. And these are a collection of neuronal somas uh, in the P, uh, PNS. And then we also have nerves. And nerves are collections of axon bundles uh, bundled together in the PNS. So just remember the PNS we've got the ganglion, which are collections of neuronal somas, and the nerves, which are collections of axon bundles. Now those same things have different names in the CNS. So in the CNS we have nuclei, and the nuclei are the collection of neuronosomas. So just remember, a ganglion is found in the PNS, while a nucleon, a nuclei, sorry, is found in the CNS. Then we have tracks in the CNS, which are a collection of axon bundles. So our tracks are synonymous with our nerves, and our ganglion is synonymous with the nuclei. Just remember which system we're talking about. So in other, in other videos, we've explained that the CNS is basically the brain plus the spinal cord. And if we're going to look more at the spinal cord, in the last video we talked about the different parts of the spinal cord. And so we looked at the meninges and we talked about the dura mater, the arachnoid space, the pia mater, uh, what the denticulate ligament is, what's the phylum phylum terminales. So we're not going to go into that again. Now we're going to kind of look more at the components of the, um, the spinal cord. So now if we look at the spinal cord itself, what we're going to see is um, the spinal cord is actually going to go down the full length of the vertebrae. And as it reaches the bottom, it's going to start kind of flaring out. And this flared area that we see, which is around L1, L2, is called the conus medullaris. And this is the kind of the ending part. And then also around the cervical and lumbar regions, which are right around here, we're going to have two enlargements. And the cervical region, what you got to remember is this is going to give rise to the brachial plexus. And the lumbar levels are going to give rise to the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus. We're going to get into other videos where we explain what the brachial plexus is and the lumbar plexus. This is going to be mainly found in the gross anatomy uh, playlist. Um, and then also what we have to know is, if we remember, we have our vertebrae. And I'm trying my best to draw the, the vertebrae. And in the vertebrae itself, there are these spaces that exist. And they're called inter intervertebral foramen. And this is where we're going to have the spinal nerves actually exiting out of. And they're going to start innervating different muscles. They're going to 
go after different tissues, and this is where we're going to have sensation, motor function, and so forth. And what you have to remember is, if it's coming out of the dorsal end, so let's look at it from here. So this is the dorsal half, and this is the ventral half. If the fibers are coming out of the dorsal half, it's going to be sensory. So this side is going to be sensory. Now if we're coming out of the ventral half, this is going to be motor. So what that means is, if sensation is coming up, it's going to come up through the dorsal half and be integrated through the spinal cord and, and ultimately the brain. And then the signal is going to come back down and go out the ventral half through the motor complex. And so what the parts of, if we're looking at the uh, spinal cord, the parts that we have to know, what we have is the FG, which is fasciculus gracilis, and the FC, which is fasciculus cunatus. This is the horn itself, and we have different parts of the horn. We've got the dorsal horn, we've got the intermediate zone, and we've got the ventral horn. And then this right here that's drawn out is the dorsal root ganglion. And what we have to remember is that if we're coming out of the dorsal, this is again sensory, it's going to be where it enters and exits. The ventral is going to be motor, it's going to be where it enters and exits. And if we're thinking about the different parts, so if we're in the cervical region of the, the spinal cord, we're going to see something different than what we'd expect in the thoracic or lumbar. So in the cervical region, some key points are that the spinal cord is going to be larger. It's flattened dorsal ventrally. It has large columns of white matter. So since it has large columns of white matter, what that's going to mean is it's going to be more. There's going to be more sensory and motor tracks um, in this region. Um, and the ventral horn is going to be larger. And that's because it's going to be innervating the, mus uh, the muscles of the upper extremities. Now, if we look at the thoracic, so I'm going to actually, yeah, I'll write it here, thoracic. The thoracic is going to be more cylindrical. Of course, it's going to be H-shaped gray, H -shaped gray matter, as we see. It's going to lack all neurons related to innervation of uh, extremities. So we have a prominent lateral horn. And this is going to contain all the sympathetic preganglionic neurons of the body. And this is going to be basically when we're above T6. So if above T6, we're going to have both the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cunatus. So these regions will be prominent or apparent in vertebrae above T6. And below T6, we're going to only have one track, which is the fasciculus gracilis. So the cunatus will not be present in, in that area. Now, if we look at the lumbar region, um, this is also cylindrical. Uh, it's going to be slight, slightly larger than the thoracic. Um, the lumbar sacral, it's going to have a lumbar sacral enlargement that's going to have neurons related to the lumbosacral plexus and, inner, and the innervations of the lower extremity. So as we're going further down, we're going to have to alter the, the structure of the, the spinal cord in order to 
be able to innervate the lower extremities. It's going to have smaller sensory and motor tracts. So now if you think about it, um, if we were to compare touch in our fingers versus our legs, there is a heightened sense of touch in our fingers relative to our legs. So that kind of resonates a little bit better with the idea of why the tracts are smaller. The greater gray, uh, gray matter um, is going to be enlarged and there's going to be less white matter. And there's an enlarged ventral horn. So the ventral horn is going to be enlarged. And this is just going to allow for motor neurons to pass through the lower extremities. And so that's why that's very important. Now, as I said, if we're looking at how a signal is passed, um, or how we can represent or say how a sensory sensory input is in, uh, is received, let's kind of think this through. So we've got our this is our um, spinal cord and we know that right here is the dorsal horn because we've got the dorsal root ganglion and then this is our ventral horn and it's going to split out So what we we have in this drawing right now is we have our dorsal root ganglion, we have our spinal nerve, we have our dorsal primary ramus, the ventral primary ramus, the white ramus communicans, the gray matter or the gray ramus communicans, and so what's going to happen is we have general sensory afferent nerves that are coming from the limbs and they're going to basically come down the track and they reach the dorsal root ganglion of the dorsal root and then the, finally what will happen is it goes up the central process the information is integrated and it's decided what should happen so if we were to think about uh, somebody putting their hand on the stove the signal is going to come up to the dorsal root ganglion, it's going to be processed, and a stove is kind of a bad example, but let's just say moving our leg instead. So we move our leg, we have a sensory response to say that we should move it. So we step on a rock and we realize we should kind of deviate, and so there is that processing in the dorsal root ganglion, which is going to go to the spinal cord, come back out, and go with the general efferent uh, and out through the efferent limb, uh, which is the motor, and then it goes through central processing, and then out the ventral root, and finally hits the target. One thing to know, we have gen uh, GSA and GSE, and GSA is gen gen general sensory afferent, while the other is the efferent. And the GSA is coming from the skin, and it's proprioception of the back. And then the GSE is intrinsic muscles of the back. Now, if we wanted to look at the breakdown from the spinal cord, what's happening? Just to give you a little bit of a clear image, what we have is we have the spinal cord itself. So we have the spinal cord as our start point. And we know that they're going to leave through the spaces that we already mentioned, the um, intervertebral um, spaces, and they're going to come out as spinal nerves.
And then at the vertebral canal, we see the splitting. And we have the dorsal ramus and the ventral ramus. And as we've learned, the dorsal is the sensory, sensory the ventral is the motor. Sorry, I said the backwards. In terms of the ramus, what happens is the dorsal is going to provide motor innervation. And this is going to be for intrinsic musculature of the back plus innervation of skin of the same region. The ventral is going to be motor plus sensory. Remember, this is these are the rami that are doing this. Um, and this is going to be for structure to derive from the ventral or anterior aspect of the embryo. So this is more when we're talking about embryogenesis. Now the last thing we need to look at in this video is how, what are the microstructures of the, um, of the peripheral nerves. So now a peripheral nerve basically is a bundle so if we were to look at it, it kind of, it looks almost like a rope. So this rope right here, it has individual subunits and a lot of the roots in anatomy and, and you'll find in other courses are going to be very similar. So if you know what some of these roots means, it becomes very helpful, not only when learning anatomy, but in, in your other courses. So if we look at this, what we have right here is the neuron. And the neuron itself is going to have a lot of little guys like this going through it. And each one of these has an individual name that needs to be known with the function. And so we're going to quickly go over each one of them. So we have the endonerium. It's a thin layer of reticular fibers between the Schwann cells and the ensheath axon. So it's kind of like this area right here that we have around each one of these. So endo means within. So if you just remember that, you should be fine. Now, if we look at the perineurium, what that is is the bundle groups of nerve fibers and sleeves of flattened epithelial sac-like. So these individual cells are the perineurium. The epi is what surrounds this whole area, so that's called the epineurium. And the epineurium is the dense fibers connected up to connective tissue that coat the peripheral nerves. So just to give you another key way of thinking about the epineurium, it's going to be surrounding the peripheral nerve. As I said, they're dense fibers that, uh, of connective tissue that is in continuous that is continuous centrally with the dura mater of the spinal cord. While the perineurium, they're going to surround the fascicles of the nerve fiber. So they're going to surround the fascicles of the nerve fiber, right? So they're going to go into each one of these nerve fibers while the epi is going to go around it. Um, and these are concentric layers of collagen strands. And then we have the endonerium, which surrounds a single peripheral nerve fiber. So if we were to look at the single fiber itself, that would be the epineurium that surrounds it. As I said, the perineurium is going to be the one that surrounds the fascicles of the, fi uh, the nerve fiber. And then the uh, epi is going to surround the entire peripheral nerve. So we've got the outside, then this layer, so if we think about it, the epineurium is going to be this whole thing. The peri is actually going to be this area. And then the endo is going to be around that individual fiber. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. If you have any questions, comments, leave them below. 
I've also provided a link where you can download the images and my notes. Uh, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel.